As we come to the second gospel in the New Testament, we come to the gospel of Mark. You'll, you'll notice it's the shortest of all four. In fact, one of the things we notice about Mark's gospel is he does everything rather quickly. In fact, some of his favorite words are words like immediately, words like and, and Mark has a very fast pace. You'll, you'll notice in Mark's gospel, he doesn't open up with the Christmas narrative. There is not a birth narrative. He just jumps right in to John the Baptist and the story about Jesus. Mark is writing from a perspective that church history tells us was likely to a Roman audience. And he's writing uh, through the lens of a Roman biographer about Jesus. But he wants to get us to the cross. He wants to get us to the resurrection. And so Mark, rather quickly, and, 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 immediately, 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 moves us in that direction. When it comes to Mark's gospel, he starts out and he says, the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ. And there are echoes of creation in Mark's gospel. But over and over again, he asks questions about Jesus's identity. Can I give you a few of these? Mark chapter 1, verse 27. What is this? A new teaching and one with authority? Mark chapter 2, verse 7. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Mark 2, 16. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Mark 4, verse 41. Who is this? Even the winds and waves obey him. Mark 6, verse 2. What is this wisdom that has been given him? Mark 7, verse 5. Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders? Throughout the Gospel of Mark, he is asking this question, and over and over again, he is revealing the answer to this. And one of the attributes that we discover early of Jesus is that Jesus has authority. In fact, he doesn't teach like the teachers of the law. He teaches with authority. And so Mark, as we walk through the Gospel, will continue to impact that identity of Jesus. He has authority in several areas. In his teaching, he has authority over sickness. He has authority over demons. And we'll discover ultimately he has authority over nature. He's going to walk on water. And finally, he has authority over death. The question for us in Mark's gospel, as we ask the question of Jesus' identity, is who do you believe Jesus to be? And what do you believe about his authority? Do you believe that he has authority to be your teacher? That he has authority to command the ultimate authority over sickness and demons and nature and death? And I know, like me, sometimes you go, but I don't always observe that in my life. I mean, what about this Jesus, the healer, the one who has authority over sickness? Have you ever asked the question, what about those who were healed? What happened to them after the story was over? Well, if you experience this broken world like I do, you know the answer. Eventually they got sick. Eventually they died. So what's with all of these authority stories, all these miracle stories and these healing stories? Well, they reveal to us who Jesus is and what will ultimately be true for us if we follow him as well. Mark wants us to ask the question, what do you believe about Jesus? Who do you believe him to be? And will you put everything on the line in following him? and trust him to be the one who can give you what he says with authority that he can give you. A couple other things about Mark's gospel that I think are interesting. We can actually divide Mark's gospel up into two different sections, and the entire uh, book hinges on Peter's confession when the identity question is asked. Peter, who do you believe I am? So Craig Blomberg divides up the gospel this way, chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 8, verse 30, Jesus's successes. And then, starting in chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus begins to reveal the nature of the fact that he's going to the cross. So the first part, Jesus' successes, his authority. The second part, Jesus reveals, I'm going to die. And so we have successes and sufferings that, that hinge on both sides of this identity question in Mark's gospel. Uh, Mark Strauss, in his uh, introduction to the gospel, uh, takes this first part, uh, chapters 1 through 8, and he says that this is all about the authority of Jesus, the Son of God. But this second part is all about Jesus, the suffering servant of God. So watch as this gospel hinges on the question, what do you believe about Jesus?
Now, inside of these chapters, chapters 1 through 8 and chapters 9 to the very end of the gospel, you'll find groupings of different narratives. For instance, in chapter 1, you'll find stories about the authority of Jesus. Chapter 2, Sabbath controversies. Chapter 4, kingdom parables. Chapter 6 through 8, boat and bread stories. Chapter 7, stories about things and people that are unclean, but Jesus making them clean. And chapter 7 and 8, miracles and parables about discipleship. Over and over again, Mark is coming back to this identity question and teaching us about Jesus, his authority, but also his willingness to come and suffer and die for us on our behalf. When it comes to the inclusio, remember what I said in Matthew's gospel about this word inclusio? Inclusio is a bookend. Mark has an inclusio as well. The inclusio is this phrase, son of God. Chapter one, verse one the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But at the very end, it's a confession. Surely this man was the Son of God. And we find this phrase throughout Mark's gospel. Jesus is, why Mark Strauss says, the suffering servant, the Son of God, but the authoritative Son of God as well. Another inclusio is the word torn. This is perhaps one of my favorite. The very beginning of Mark's gospel, Jesus' baptism, heaven is rendered open, torn open. And God says, this is my son. But it's at the end that the temple curtain is torn open. That barrier that represented the distance that we have from the presence of God, that only the blood of sacrifice can allow us through. No, at the end, that is torn open. Jesus' baptism, the curtain at the end. We find this access that we now have because of the authority and identity of Jesus into heaven. Then there's this final little thing that I love about Matthew's gospel or Mark's gospel is there's this secret that seems to take place in Mark's gospel. Uh, Scholars call it the messianic secret. Have you noticed in Mark's gospel as you drive through these familiar streets that more so in Mark's gospel than even in the others, Jesus is telling people, don't tell anyone who I am. Uh, Don't tell anyone. He heals people and he'll send them away. They want to tell someone. I mean, it's good news. But Jesus says, shh, don't tell anyone. Throughout the entire gospel of Mark, Jesus is telling people to keep quiet, to not tell anyone who he is and what he has done and the nature of his identity. But as we come to the end of Mark's gospel and we come to the resurrection account, Mark's gospel ends in a weird way. In fact, if you notice in your gospel, uh, your Bible, Mark chapter 16, verse 8, There's a line there in most Bibles. And under that line, uh, you should have some sort of a a footnote like this. The earliest manuscripts and other ancient witnesses do not have verses 9 through 20. Uh, That's because it's true. Uh, They're just trying to tell you that verses 9 through 20, there's a question mark about whether whether or not Mark originally wrote those and included those in his gospel. So how would this gospel end if it ends with chapter 16, verse 8, well, here's how it would end. Trembling and bewildered, the women went away from the tomb. They fled, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, that's a strange way to end a gospel. The resurrection takes place. The women are there to witness that resurrection. But they leave the tomb, and they're afraid. They run away. And they don't tell anyone about the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead. They don't tell anyone the good news. So let me get this straight. Throughout the entire gospel, Jesus has said, the time's not right, don't tell. Keep it a secret. When the time's right, I want you to go and tell. Then we get to the very end. Jesus has been crucified. He's raised from the dead. And the messenger says, go tell. But they don't. Why would Mark end his gospel that way? Well, apparently that's why a scribe or the early church or someone in the early church added on verses 9 through 20 in Mark's gospel. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that they're not original with Mark. But why end this way? Here's maybe one reason. I think Mark, as he writes to his audience, has a few questions for us. That he wants you to ask, what do you believe about Jesus? Who do you believe him to be? Do you believe him to have authority? 
Do you believe that Jesus came as the suffering servant, the one in the Old Testament that Isaiah prophesied about, that he came, that he came to die, but also to show us how to live? Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? So, if you believe that good news, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to go and tell? Are you going to leave this gospel, this good news story, and not tell anyone because you're afraid? You see, I think Mark's gospel leaves us with a cliffhanger on purpose because we, in our own telling the good news of the resurrection of Jesus, get to walk away from the tomb, run away from the tomb, and make the decision on whether whether we're going to keep quiet because of our fear or with courage because of the authority of who Jesus is and what he came to do, share that good news with anyone that crosses our path. You have an opportunity to make disciples. And Mark would say, be courageous, not because of who you are, but because of who he is and what he's done. So leave the tomb transformed, changed, and bold.